from Romanus down to the theory of books, a particular history of some sort. Um, is it too bright? How is that? If you can't see it, it's going to be difficult. Can, can you see it in there? OK. Um, so, uh, I, this is going to be awkward because of the following. It's my practice, you do not on purpose to try to squeeze a quart into a pint pot. So, uh, I tried to resist this, so I spent a lot of time in this meeting. And I put it in bullets, and I have about 24 of them. And I've got about half an hour max, so it's going to be one a minute per bullet. Okay, so... Um, I want the overview is as it says that the multiplicative function will be seen. There it is, GAGB, GAB for GAGB of AB plus one. But you forget that condition with as few side conditions as possible. And the idea is you end up with seeing it as a character on the multiplicative group of positive rationals. And I'm doing this history in here. In the finished job, it will be more extensive, but here I'm going to just in relationship to myself and to Ramanujan. So here we go. We start off with the Ramanujan's function, the tau n, and the writing gets bigger as we proceed. Um, and here we go. Here's the tau n, and it's given like this, and it appears in his studies of 24 squares in the error term. And it just appears, boom, in the paper. And he makes two conjectures. Here's the one. That it's got an Euler, the corresponding Dirichlet series as an Euler product. Although he uses T, where we have S. And the second conjecture, which is right out of the air, that half TP squared is less than P to the 11. Uh, one does only to look at this conjecture and see at once that it's going to be uh, the precursor of an awful lot, and to wonder where the heck this came from. OK. So <coughs> no doubt proves conjecture one is valid. Um, if you write uh, e to the 2 pi i z n, where you had x to the n, then on this side is a modular, uh, homomorphic modular form, and on this side, is its Fourier expansion at infinity. OK, this is for the action of SL2Z on the upper half plane. OK, and wait, 12. Well, so what comes from here? So what does Mordell do? He constructs a second form so that it has the properties that Ramalajan wants. He builds a ratio and then proves the ratio, which is an analytic function, is invariant on and then bound it and then use a variant of Louisville's theorem and says it's a constant or finished. Actually, the, the, the forms belong to a space of dimension one. So as soon as he's constructed another function, he's bound to some C. But he perhaps doesn't know that. OK, then this is a precursor of heck operators and what not, what not. So that is successful. But you see already he's pushed the subject into the world of automorphism. OK, next. Well, maybe I should cover these up, otherwise you're going to read ahead and not bother. <laughs> uh, here's Rankin. And so we skip to 1939. These little square boxes have got the dates in, and you'll see the leaps are large. Now, the average value of tau n squared is, uh, as you see, x to the 11. You can't see it? Oh. oh, I see. Oh, I'm sorry. OK, I'd better look at the screen instead of you. <laughs> Pity, but there we are. OK, there we go. And now, th this is achieved by an analytic continuation. And what he does is set up what he wants. There's mean value on the 
left, and then sees the integral and uses transformations into the uh, fundamental region. And so he's beginning to do what is going to be the end of things, which is you integrate over some quotient. Right. Um, then the next one, which is far up, is Lehmer at 1947, who says, is tau n for n positive ever zero? Apparently he didn't conjecture, but we do say now that it's a conjecture, and we say not. Right. So next piece is a little bit out of order because that is the way it's best understood. The name proof conjecture to uh, in 1974, uh, this is using, of course, as you know, the algebraic varieties over finite fields, the Riemann hypothesis so called, and uh, the conjecture is all very vague and very elaborate. Now, this makes sense with the Sato Tate conjecture. If you now think of p to the minus of n half tau p as two cos theta p, then theta p is a real valued function, one might say, between zero and pi, and it's real. It already appears in Ramanujan's original paper, but complex valued. And he uses it formally quite carefully and properly and proves all sorts of relationships. So he, he knew what it would look like when it was finished, if it were true. Now, this being done, you can count the number of primes up to x, and uh, their frequency for which the angles lie in an interval. And so the other take conjecture says that in the limit, they will be distributed according to that interval. Over pi. Integral alpha and the beta sine phi is square to phi. Okay, between alpha and beta and the integral. Now, I have to, I'm not going to say too much here. I haven't investigated how the name got stuck. But there is a little account in uh, the Atlantic Book of Serre, 1968, um, that Tate um, introduced what would be the corresponding object from the theory of elliptic curves, and then made the corresponding object to, I suppose, a symmetric product L functions, and said that they would be holomorphic. And if this were true, this would follow for the curves. And somebody, I don't know who, lifted the whole conjecture up to hold for all holomorphic functions. Uh, and there's, well, never mind. OK, so it, now you can see that a, that uh, far from going away, the, the studies become more and more sophisticated. No, am I going fast? No, okay, right. Let me see, I've got another 18 not to go. So, next. Okay, so what happened? Uh, in 1980, uh, I was in in Imperial College on the Guggenheim, and, and I asked myself, along with other things, what is uh, the likelihood you can prove that the mean value of the absolute tau in n to the minus 11 halves is zero? It's pretty clear that you can use Cauchy Schwarz inequality, but I don't think that the corresponding theory play series would you put minus s along so it's minus 11 halves, is going to be too easy. In any case, it would certainly have an essential singularity at the interesting point. I renormalize everything in here so the interesting point is s equals 1. Okay, so I proved the theorem. So here you see the multiplicative functions start coming in. And they start coming in with this least <coughs> uh, assumption that you can manage. So G is multiplicative and non-negative, and delta is between 0 and 1. And we make this assumption that the G has a mean value. Then all the other mean values, which you get by replacing G by G to the delta, also exist. And they must be 0 unless 
the series over the primes of p minus 1, uh, square root of p minus 1 to the square root is convergent. You will notice here there's nothing else on g. OK, if you put g equals tau squared n to the minus 11, in this last condition, it would contradict the sato Tate conjecture, which you just seen, which everybody believed in. So the mean value of a delta should be 0, and so a1 should be 0. <coughs> I published this, I think, in the Journal of the Australian Mathematical Science. And in it, I also put the following conjecture. The frequency of the integers up to x, for which absolute power n to the minus 11 halves, is less than or equal to log x to the minus half x of z mu constant log log x to the half. That goes to the normal law, the standard normal law, as x goes to infinity. Um, I didn't know mu at the time, uh, actually. Mu turns out to be the square root of pi squared over 12 plus a half. Um, this conjecture is still not true, although things are getting nearer. Um, yes. Uh, I must say that if you're interested, working at the constants in these things is a little bit tricky. I remember, I think that the, the referee to the paper must have been ranking because he points out that one of my calculations was wrong. And if you see one of his other papers, he goes into it in detail afterwards. So there we go. Ready? So um, we did prove it, uh, uh, Moreno, Shahidi, and myself. The mean value is less than x log x to the minus 118. And this uses the analytic properties of tau n to the fourth, really. I mean, tau n to the fourth with n to the minus 22 minus s. They, they were proved first by Shahidi, and then Moreno and Shahidi proved there's a double pole, that s equals 1, and the double pole is what makes it work. And at rock bottom, you approximate the absolute value of y by a quadratic polynomial. You, you do the best you can. So I'll put an arrow for rank in there because a few more things were known about tau, and this means you could choose a slightly bigger polynomial and get slightly more accurate. Nowadays, it will not matter because, as you see from mine, Taylor and cohorts, I hope you'll excuse me, Richard Taylor, because he was in so many papers, proved that for the holomorphic functions, the tau Tate is correct. So that means all the moments in there are understood in some sense. Now I should say something here about this, just a little. The relevant animal, the symmetric product L series, they don't actually deal with that. Uh, they chop off uh, all the early valuations, including the other ramified, uh, the ramified bits, and then handle the what's left. And then they prove analytic uh, possible properties up to the line sigma equals 1. So they overlap just a teeny, teeny bit. Uh, but they don't go past. So there is therefore no zero free region in view, which is uniform in the parameters of the order of the symmetric product. I asked him about this, and he said, no, there isn't. So that means that the basic asymptotic is all you get comes from the Wiener Nikahara theorem. That if the error term were better, you could do the Australian conjecture essentially. But it's not better. And so it needs a little more up to a bit little o x over log x cubed. Okay, so now I push on. I was working on this a bit so I proved the N abstract central limit theorem. This is in a Lithuanian publication. Uh, because it's in honor of Kubilius. It was for his 90th birthday meeting, but then he died, and I didn't go to the meeting, and so it was a memorial. Okay, um, now the point is here. Because the multiplicative function was constrained with very little, it would apply also to the mass forms. That's the whole point. 
The whole point is to strip out as much as you can of the properties of the molten plate. So here, here is the big fat mess applied to <laughs> the tau function. It isn't the original conjecture. We don't have enough info. So it's however weighted with the mean square. And of course, the beta at the bottom is the mean square constant. And there you go. Instead of the renormalizing function, it says ax and bx, and they're written underneath. <coughs> and the asymptotic estimates follow from the sato tate, because the tau belongs to the world of holomorphic cusp forms. So we can use it. When you're doing the distribution function, as everybody's tried it knows, that involves multiplicative functions, the value of the function on finitely many things, like primes, really isn't relevant. So it was perfectly safe that Taylor threw out a few of the primes. OK, you can now, you see, as a result of this, actually replace the bx by this constant, pi squared over 3 minus 5 over 2 to the half, log log x in this function, to the half. And then the ax is asymptotically a half plus little o log log x. What has happened is that it keeps the same form, but the constants change, because I've got a weight in it. What, what about the weight? Well, the weight is a mean square, which is a perfectly natural object from the group representation point of view, since all your representations go into in verbal form, we have operators on a Hilbert space, so everything inside is a mean square. OK, however, that's not what the conjecture said originally. The advantage of this particular conject, this particular weight is that it works for the mass forms as well as the homomorphic ones. OK, um, so here's the abstract version, so I'm not giving it. But I'm showing what you do is take the weight tau in into the minus 11 half squared and replace it by g. And in order to make it work, you need this for g. It has a mean value with a decent error. A few flaky conditions are needed because the probability model has to handle the odd, not quite small prime power. I only find out many of them, you notice. And then the b, you see the b, it's like it is up there. Only it's got a g in it. And it has to have this growth condition. That growth condition would be artificial in normal circumstances, but it's uh, usually very well satisfied in the automorphic world. So that's fine. OK, so you see from this, you could apply it to the, to the now here comes the nasty piece if you want to read. Here it goes. Um, let's see, I've got a few minutes here. So these results depend, as you can read, on the analytic properties of the symmetric function product L series. Attached to the whole of all the mass forms. In a minute, I'll show where the mass forms come from. Right representations of the from GL2AQ, the adults. You can also do analogs of these things with appropriate changes when you replace the Q by an algebraic extension. It suffices to have information. Now, this is not quite so expected. I only had a non trivial open disk array S equals 1. We do not have to go all up the line. Um, I may say there are beautiful theorems of Aldon and Landau, which apply extremely well here, from an old time ago. Um, so for mass forms, so for whole order forms, you can use two and four because, because we have Deline and the Sabotate. But for mass forms, you need two, four, and six because you don't have either the Deline or the Sabotate, or the analogs of such. But their results are done by Kim and Shahidi. They have a grip on the general case, very good grip up to the k equals 4, and a, a satisfactory grip from analytical point of view up to 9. I think after that, things are not done. OK. So there, we leave the distribution function, but we're still on tau. So now if you decide that you count the number of integers up to x for which the tau does not vanish, you call that dx. It was proved by Sarah that it's actually a constant times x. Uh, this has happened because tau is of a nice class. But the theorem that follows has this analog, as you see, for mass forms. So OK, if you divide 
because the constant need not be 1. If it were a 1, we would have solved Lambert's conjecture. And then take those tiles which are less than 0, you get what you would expect. Half of them, positive half of them in A. OK. Um, notice we're counting over the dx. We're not saying half all the integers. We don't know half of the integers. Similarly, for holomorphic card forms, as long as they're not complex multiplication type. OK, with congruent subgroups. Then you can do it for mass forms, too. The mass forms, so at the bottom you'll see a mass cut form. So here it comes. Here's the equation showing it's a solution of a partial differential equation which belongs to an L squared, I mean, a Hilbert space. It's the Peterson inner product, but of course you're using the harmonic. And here's this uh, expansion, and the AN is there. So if you took away this piece, it looks just like the holomorphic case. And you can see, actually, if you, if you didn't have that part there, and you cancelled the y squared, you'd be back in the holomorphic case. OK. So uh, the problem there is that we don't know anything hardly about the ANs, except if they have the proper operator properties. Well, they have solutions. This f is a solution, an uh, eigenfunction. And then they are more duplicative. So all we can do is this. We can prove the number of n's for which n's the bounce is bigger than x or the power below x. But if you're dividing by it, it doesn't matter. But it will matter because it put pressure on your theory of all duplicative functions. Because you have now not to know local issues, but only a sort of gray, big global issue. And then the lower bound for such Thing. So that is a non-trivial thing. Even when the multiplicative function is tri almost trivial, finding a lower bound is actually not quite as obvious as you would think. Okay, so now I skip. So there for the minute we stop and we go back again to 1916-17 and here comes Harley and Ramajan. This is the second spin for And omega is the number of primes that divide m. And they prove that omega n is normally log log n. This is introducing new isotopic, although I don't think Heidi was too fond of probability, which was then not axiomatized. Uh, normally means we leave out the bad cases. So, okay, Turan gave a very nice proof. Uh, and there is his inequality, and he assumed the f were uniformly bounded. He's working within the isotopic of Heidi and Ramanujan. And then comes Adolf Katz, so you see here they go 16, 1934, 1940. And sure enough, there is a nice uh, paradigmatic model, and that's saying the same thing twice, of convergence to the normal rule. And look, log log n is square root log log n comes. And you can, in fact, tie this into the automorphic world through the Eisenstein series. So they don't know it, but they're at the edge of a giant. Uh, Swamp or empire, according to your inclination. <laughs> okay, so look here. Uh, there's could be this. Now I mention these because of the following. First of all, the one you, the theorem about g to the delta, this used probabilistic non-theory argument. Okay, um, mainly in that case provided by Edel. So uh, it has begun to feed into the other parts. There's a generalized to Durand Kabilis inequality in there's a sample which would apply to the tau function. And the f is completely arbitrary, but the tau of course is not. Right. And that belongs surprisingly to 1987. So note at the bottom, Krishna Aladi wrote a long paper on the Durand Kabilis inequality in its dual, the additive function restricted to integers without large prime factors. Uh, not for the fiat, but as uh, uh, Gerald Tannenbaum says. And uh, this is in Krella, nice paper, nice journal, 1982. Before saying farewell and moving to Q series. And you're going to say the Q's big, it should be small, to which I reply not in his case. Okay, now we're going to join them all up. Uh, Clark Doyle in 1968 introduced this notion, a sequence of positive integers, an, is a set of uniqueness of every completely additive function that vanishes on the an, vanishes identically. 
and he gave his a conjecture that shifted primes as such. But then he introduced a number of other problems the following year, and here's one. Characterize the additive functions that satisfy this. FAN plus B minus etc. etc. Do you see it? Go to C. So okay, I solved those two problems. Now, what made the thing move? 1978, Volker, uh, Dieter Volker, Francois Dress, and Bodo Falken introduced this theorem. The sequence AM is a set of uniqueness, even only if every positive integer R has such a representation. R to the B is a product, plus or minus one that we noticed in the experiment. And there are finitely many terms. In the K depends on R, and the V depends upon R, etc., etc. And then Meyer did the analog for multiplicity functions. So that means there's an algebraic equivalent. Well, it's baby Fourier analysis, harmonic analysis, really. Okay, I've got to watch it here about five minutes. I've got to move this. Okay, so I introduced the localized L squared theory of the gaps between, and then wrote straight into the arithmetic functions and integer products stringer book. Just wrote straight in without publishing anything. So I got the convergence in mean square, basically, and could do the limit balls. But then over here you see the Q stars group, and then you factor out, I decided to do this, the group generated by your chosen integers AM, and now you try to find that group. And you try to find it by using harmonic analysis. And G is finitely generated, I proved this. In this case, when we take the AM plus B over AM plus B, uh, where are we? There. And so that's what gamma is, the integer is there. And you take n bigger than k, so you can get infinitely many representations. And then you, you get torsion, group, determinant, and everything, the generators and the rank. But all of this is by homomorphisms into the additive reals. So I can get a solution like this, but I can't tell you the best v for each r. But it's uniformly bent by the degree of the, basically, the, quote, the torsion group. So, okay, I pushed ahead here with some help, tendon plant, a turban, a hill grant. And then this is the correlations and sums of additive functions, AMS memoir. Let's see, I've got to pay three, four minutes. Yeah. Okay, so inevitably, this leads to the study of correlations. And there they are. Unfortunately, they depend very heavily on parameters and x. Never mind, I had in mind always the group. So here we are at the bottom, and I made some conjectures that G should have to be near to a generalized character in order that this correlation be large. Uh, there are various variants of them. I skip ahead because it's too much. And look it, uh, someone provided a fair sized brick here <laughs> and proved a version of this inequality, this uh, conjecture when logarithmic weights, and he says basically if enough of these sums are large, then this correlation is small. The moduli and the values of power are allowed to move. However, I studied that kind of thing, the movement, already inside the probabilistic number theory world. I, I haven't enough time here to show you the influences all the way up. And so uh, fixing the tau and the character was therefore not straightforward, but I knew how to do it. So, uh, Elliot and Kish, he was a graduate student, he's finished now. Um, of course, he's got his PhD. We determined the groups Q star over gamma A n plus B through their jewels by the harmonic analysis. And here are some little pictures that you see. You start from Q star, you go to the group G you want, you take its character, and this leads you to a multiplicative function which satisfies G A M plus B over A M plus B is 1. So, of course, the correlation is large, so that causes plenty of constraint. And now you have to somehow tie down the chi, the T, and show that this is adequate to determine the whole group. And it turns out that the torsion group is a homomorphism of the residues, reduced residues, modulo 2, A A delta, that's the discriminant of the A A B's uh, cubed. All right, so no time for running out. Here's an example. Gamma is generated by 5m plus 1 over 5m minus 1. 5 is free, you're never going to generate it. So you put point Q5 star, that's the multiplicative rationalist cocon 5. 
then this group that you want is dual determined by the trivial character and the Legendre symbol. So what do you get? 19 you can do, because it's Legendre symbol is 1. 17 square you can do, but 17 you cannot. And so uh, the more complicated ones are the same only worse. And if you want to do gamma itself, that's to say the very group that these generate, then this dual is best looked at. It's infinitely many unit circles, product of same. And then you quotient by the elements one, 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 and minus one, minus one, minus one, what the genre symbol gives. Okay, thank you for your consideration, and a very happy birthday, uh, Krista. And thank you all for the support. for the screaming rush. So I did what I always do. Maybe time for one question. By the way, they, can, uh, they conjectured the result of the rate of Kish in the 1985 spring. Sorry. Okay, I guess we'll reserve them four minutes. Oh, sorry. Yes. That's in the you run yes, that's in the run yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you.